All right. So you get this polarization by putting something between your parallel plate capacitor. Where's that coming from? What's the physical origin of it? We showed you one with the molecule, where the molecule can actually rotate. But there's actually a couple different mechanisms and origins of this, right? So there's the electronic, right? We've said before, right? The electron, we draw it as this sphere where the electrons are sort of evenly spaced around it. But we know that in the presence of an electric field, we already showed you that the nucleus could be one direction. You can get it sort of uh, more electrons on the other. So that would be what we call electronic polarization, right? Typically, this is not a very large amount, but it is an amount, right? Then you can get ionic contribution to polarization. In this case, the ions, right, these atoms that have been charged, right, so cations and anions, they themselves, because they have a charge, they can move in response to a field. So here on the left, I've done my best to show a something like a rock salt structure, right? So you have this alternating positive, negative anion and cation structure. But in an electric field, what happens is that the cation wants to move Right, the cation has shifted and the anion has shifted, and so you end up with, again, polarization is equal to the charge difference times the physical space separation. So you can get the atoms shifting a little bit in an electric field. That would be ionic contribution. You can get orientational, again, if there are a bunch of randomly oriented molecules of water, and then you apply an electric field, then all these things are going to line up right, in the electric field. So that would be orientational, where these things literally orient themselves with respect to the electric field. This requires that your material has a permanent dipole, okay? Um, and so the overall polarization that you'll see will actually be all these things added up. You're going to get a contribution from the electrons, a contribution from your ions, a contribution from orientation, right? All these things together will add to it. And what's interesting is that you can actually suss out the exact contribution from each type. If you want to know how much is electronic and how much is ionic and how much is orientational, you can figure that out. And how you do it is with a frequency dependence test. This is pretty cool. Um, so you're going to use an AC electric field. You're going to alternate the field. So if you applied an alternating field, then your water molecules, which were lined up like this before, right, lined up this way, then you switch the field, they have to switch and they have to do this. And that's going to take some time, right? Because the molecule has to like rotate around to the other side or flip around or something. It has to change. And that has some time dependence. So what if you're switching it so fast that you don't give it time for that to happen? You'll see a reduction in the net polarization, right? You won't see that polarization happen. So we can actually do that. If we plot polarizability as a function of frequency, so over here is really fast, and to the left it's really slow, what we typically see is something that looks like this. So over here, this contribution, the first one that you lose as you start to speed it up, that's going to be orientational, right? And then this contribution that you lose as you speed it up, eventually you're going to lose that contribution. That's going to be from ions actually physically moving. So that's going to be ionic. And then if you go really fast, this down here is going to be electronic, right? Where technically electrons can move around really, really quickly. And so they're going to be the easiest to switch over all frequency ranges. But as you move to really, really faster and faster frequencies, you're going to lose your ionic and your orientational. So you can do this sort of switching to observe your different mechanisms, and you can actually calculate how much is coming from each. By the way, this is how we use this all the time. This is how microwaves work, right? Uh, a microwave, what they do is they intentionally tune the microwave uh, that you heat your food up in, right? They tune it to be right there at the orientation of, at the, at the basically the, the cutoff between your orientation of your polar molecules, right? Your water molecules and your food, they've tuned the frequency of the microwave to be right at that same frequency because what they want it to do is to be causing your your water molecules to want to move back and forth, but it can't do it really efficiently. You want a loss function. Um, basically, you want it to be right near the, the range at which it's able to switch, and that generates uh, this frustration as it can't quite just switch, and so it, it sort of is vibrating, and you end up with it heating up due to this uh, dielectric heating, right? This is a dielectric heating is what that is, okay? Um, that's why your microwave has a very specific frequency that it works at. It's been tuned to work to heat up water molecules, but not your plate, because let's say your plate relies on ionic motion. You're at a very different frequency, and so you're not getting that uh, loss function because you've tuned it to be associated with orientational polarization, okay? Um, again, that so the relaxation frequency is going to be the inverse of your minimum reorientation time, and you can use that for things like dielectric heating, okay? Um, another thing we should say about dielectric before we move on is that there does exist a f electric field which if you exceed that critical field, even though it shouldn't conduct electricity, it does conduct, right? So you had your parallel plate capacitor, right? And you filled it with some sort of ceramic, and you start building up lots and lots of charge on these on these faces, right? If you get too much, 
what you actually get is the electrons are able to travel all the way across and you basically melt your material. You just destroy it in that, in that intermediate region. That's known as dielectric breakdown. It is irreversible uh, breakdown. It's like localized melting, burning, or vaporization. You can see it here. Here they applied a, let's say, like a negative source right there, and then they had metal on all these other faces, and they had a nice uniform positive charge. If they increased the voltage, right, the electric field between this negative and those positives, eventually it's going to break down through your material and generate these really cool patterns like this. So people do this in wood to make cool patterns and all sorts of things. Um, usually, as a materials engineer, you don't want this to happen. It looks like that if you zoom in on it with a microscope. It's a region that's been burned and destroyed in your material because you have dielectric breakdown. So um, dielectric breakdown is a electric field um, up over which you can't go if you don't want to get this thing uh, prevent it from breaking down.